the world authority that, above all others, stood in a position to help the Jews was the papacy. As has already been comprehensively demonstrated in earlier videos, the Roman Catholic Church was primarily responsible, from early in the Christian era, for the infection of her adherents with the virulent anti-Semitism syndrome. The outrageous distortion of the Bible by so-called church fathers, such as Chrysostom, in the 4th century, unleashed a Jew-murdering monster that has roamed the world to this day and is still very active. That teaching, so opposed to all that Christ actually taught, fostered that Cain Lamech spirit in the hearts of countless generations of children throughout Europe, who, under church influence, grew up despising the Jews, and who were prepared to join in the next pogrom on the flimsiest of pretexts. Even educated and supposedly enlightened churchmen like Martin Luther were utterly poisoned, leaving the same legacy to succeeding generations, Protestant as well as Catholic, Eastern as well as Roman. The enlightenment and the revolutionary spirit of liberty, equality, and fraternity could not eradicate the disease, not from continental Europe, nor from the more progressive Britain. And the thousands of Europeans who crossed the Atlantic to found the bright new world, staunchly anti-papal as they may have been in earlier centuries, spread the germs in American soil. Hitler's ideology was the logical outcome of vitriolic Catholic and Lutheran indoctrination justified in the scientifically refined terms of the modern era and applied with the efficiency of 20th century technology. But at the root it was the darkened, sordid bestiality of the crusades and inquisitions, as was all too evident when jack-booted SS guards kicked gasping, blood-vomiting Jews to death on the ground, machine-gunned groups of shivering naked women standing defenseless at the edge of their grave, or injected phenol poison directly into the hearts of conscious little children. The Hitlers, Himmlers and Eichmanns, sitting in their offices, operating elegantly with white gloves, who ordered the coded term, special treatment, which simply meant murder, were not the only ones responsible. So were the white and yellow robed princes in the Vatican, the self-styled spiritual fathers of Europe's millions. Pope John XXIII, Ron Kelly, appears to have realized the church's role in Jewish history, judging by the personal conscience smitten prayer he as her representative, recorded shortly before his death. We realize now that many many centuries of blindness have dimmed our eyes, so that we no longer see the beauty of thy chosen people, and no longer recognize in their faces the features of our firstborn brother. We realize that our brows are branded with the mark of Cain. Centuries long has Abel lain in blood and tears, because we had forgotten thy love. Forgive us the curse which we unjustly laid, on the name of the Jews. Forgive us that, with our curse, we crucified thee, a second time. The time for the church, to have realized and acted, however, was before the Holocaust. During the 1930s Pope Pius XI had plenty of opportunity, to perceive the coming storm, with diplomatic representatives, known as nuncios, and an extensive network of church officials in every country in the world, plus millions of adherents, the Vatican had an intelligence gathering capability second to none. It also enjoyed relative immunity from interference and arrest. Pius XI did, at last, speak out in a public statement. Issued the 25th of September 1938, a year before he died. The Catholic Church disapproves, in an especial manner, that hatred which is generally termed anti-Semitism. Seen in the light of one and a half millennia of history and the context of years of intense Nazi propaganda and persecution, the statement was, at best, totally inadequate. Coming from the claimant to the position of the highest moral authority in the world and supposedly attacking the policy fostered by his own church, a policy embedded deep in the attitudes of European civilization, it was platitudinous, tokenism, lacking in substance, and it came at a time when, Despite the Concordat concluded with Hitler, Pius XI also witnessed the victimization of some Catholics. In these circumstances it was not difficult to express, on behalf of the Jews, a paternalistic disapproval of anti-Semitism. In any case there was that, that was looming, to be fought with a new and more diabolical generation of weapons, spelt danger for all parties. Few informed persons shared Chamberlain's convictions of peace in our time and the Pope's reference to the threatening storm clouds of destructive religious wars suggests he wasn't deceived. 
Europe was heading for a cauldron of disaster, aimed at the Jew in particular, and no time was to be lost in reigning in the anti-Semitic warmongering Nazis of the Third Reich. Responsibility for any action on the part of the Catholic Church rested, after a year, with Parcelli, who ascended the papal throne in 1939, as Pope Pius XII. The Church had made, from history's point of view, a most appropriate choice. Parcelli had been papal nuncio to Germany, from the end of World War I to 1931, Vatican Secretary of State thereafter, and had been the architect of the 1933 Concordat, with Hitler. If anyone understood the situation in the crisis year of 1939, it was him. He was fully acquainted with the character of the Hitlerite regime and the indoctrination of the SS in brutal anti-Semitic policies. But no encyclical expanding on Pius XI's criticisms ever emerged, nor any call to the Catholics in Germany, Poland, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Romania, etc., to rally behind the church in opposition to Nazi anti-Semitism, a call that would have been totally at variance with Rome's historical stand. Far from endeavoring to paralyze the Führer's plans by compliance, the Vatican stayed back and saw the prejudice that it had created, murder 6 million Jews and many many others as well. Throughout most of the war, at least until the Allies seemed to be in a winning position, Pius XII maintained a discreet silence on the Jewish catastrophe. The situation that developed in Vichy France, cooperated with the anti-Semitic laws of Pétain, has already been mentioned in the last video, as has their temporary protests over the deportation of Jews in barbarous circumstances. The papacy, however, did become directly implicated in France. Petin, unsure of papal backing for his anti-Semitic policies, sought advice in the matter from his ambassador in the Vatican. The reply of the papal spokesman forwarded on 2 September 1941 assured him of the absence of any papal criticism. Meris and Paxton record further that the church was fundamentally opposed to racist theories, being long committed to the unity of mankind within the human species. However, the Jews were not merely a religious community, but a group with ethnic particularities. There was consequently every reason to limit their activity in society and restrict their influence. Important theological and legislative precedent on this point went back to St. Thomas Aquinas. Therefore, reported Barrett, who was the French ambassador to the Vatican, it is legitimate to deny them access to public office, also legitimate to admit them, only in a fixed proportion to the universities, numerous clauses, and the liberal professions. Thus while theoretically opposing racism, the Vatican supported it. Why was it that Jews alone had ethnic particularities? In thus speaking Pius XII had endorsed its age-old anti-Semitic policy. And, most importantly, endorsed it at a time when massacres were in progress in occupied Russia and the old Catholic discriminations of using Jewish stars and incarceration in ghettos were in full swing in Germany and occupied Poland, ominous moves towards the final solution. Why was there not a severe warning against such things issued to Petin and the rest of Europe at this time? The historical position of the church supplies the answer. Papal acquiescence contributed directly to the shocking deportations a year later in mid-1942 when, despite agitation on the part of some clerics, the historians record, the Pope himself remained resolutely silent. Vichy reminded the church officials that the Pope had not personally spoken out on the affair. Yet the papal nuncio in France informed the Vatican Secretary of State on 7 August 1942 that the French population disbelieved the alleged work camp in the East reason for the deportations, since children, the sick, the elderly and women were all shoved into the cattle trucks. Furthermore, at this time, reports of gas cells were reaching the Allies from inside occupied Poland. Earlier than most observers, Lich theme in Geneva had, by September 1942, pieced together the overall picture. Jews by the train load were being deported from all over Europe to Nazi-occupied Poland, and yet the ghettos and camps in Poland were not increasing in population. They too were being depopulated. To a request from the US to review the position of the Jews in Europe, he responded in a letter on the 18th of September in highly emotional terms evincing pessimism despair and frustration bordering on anger. The historian Gilbert quotes some of his words. 
one or two millions are already dead. And the other four or five millions are somewhere between life and death. I do not know if nearer to life or to death. Those who did not die from hunger and disease may be killed by other methods. Hitler has sworn that in his Europe there will be no Jews at the end of this war. Maybe there will be one day such a second front which will free the Dutch, the Belgians, the French from the invader. But the Jews in these countries will not be among the freed people. Hitler is seeing to that. The deportations have now started for the Jews in Belgium, Holland, and occupied France, and even for the 10,000 Jewish refugees in non-occupied France. You wanted a survey of the position of the Jews in Europe. You wanted facts and figures. Have I stated the facts? Some of them, but very few. Think of the facts behind the facts, of the rivers of tears, and the streams of blood, the broken limbs, and the naked bodies, the bleeding feet, and the crying children, the stench and the filth, the biting cold, and the gnawing hunger, the black despair in millions of hearts. Try to think of the last thoughts of the three Jews who were paraded through a Polish town and hanged for having tried to obtain some food from non-Jews. Feel the feelings of the Jewish mother in Paris who threw her six children and then herself out of the window when the police came to take her away to a camp and then to Poland. Have I stated the facts? I have written 4,000 words and I have said nothing. Use your imagination, friend. In a memorandum two weeks earlier Lichtheim had indicated that there was a chance to save the Jews of Hungary, Romania, and Italy if the Vatican, or some neutral power, could speak out to the leaders. On the 26th of September 1942, Roosevelt's personal representative to Pius XII, Marin Taylor, sent a detailed update to Maglian, the Vatican Secretary of State, asking what the Pope could do. The papal office in reply admitted having heard similar evidence but said it could not be substantiated, nor did the Pope have any practical suggestions to make. Is it conceivable that two men in Geneva could piece together the truth better than the whole network of the Catholic Church with eyes and ears everywhere? The facts suggest he simply didn't want to know or had full knowledge and was in agreement with Germany. With the flood of horrifying stories reaching the West, a special declaration on war crimes was published by the Allies on the 17th of December 1942, condemning in the strongest possible terms the bestial policy of cold-blooded extermination. Supported by the UK, US, and Russia, the policy was also publicly endorsed by the governments in exile of Belgium, Czechoslovakia, Greece, Luxembourg, Holland, Norway, Poland, Yugoslavia and National France. When read in the House of Commons in London, the members rose and stood in solemn mourning. The British and US governments immediately requested the Vatican to use its influence on Catholics to restrain the anti-Jewish atrocities and to associate itself with the declaration. The Vatican declined stating that it still could not verify the reports and that the general Christmas message of the Pope, seeking the vow of mankind to help all the victims of the war, including the hundreds of thousands of persons who, without any fault on their part, sometimes only because of nationality of race, have been consigned to death or a slow decline, had satisfied all the demands upon him to speak out in the light of the Catholic Church's primary responsibility for anti-Semitism and the stage reached by Hitler's mass murder, the Pope's response was a criminal abrogation of responsibility. In July and August 1943, with the overthrow of Mussolini, the Germans occupied northern Italy, where many Jews were sheltering under the milder anti-Semitism of the government of Rome. In October the Nazis pounced on the Jewish refugees who had no way of escape. The Swiss borders were closed. The Jews of Rome were deported despite a reported Vatican protest to stop these arrests. But the Germans knew the papal protest was only lip service to the Jewish cause. A revealing dispatch from the German ambassador to the Vatican, Ernst von Weizsäcker, to the foreign ministry in Berlin. On the 28th of October 1943 contained the following passage. The Pope, although he is said to be under pressure from various sides, has not allowed himself to be forced into any demonstrative statement against the deportation of the Jews from Rome. Although he can expect this attitude to be resented by our enemies and exploited by the Protestant circles in Anglo-Saxon countries for the purpose 
of propaganda against Catholicism. He has done all he could, in this delicate question, to avoid straining relations with the German government and the German authorities in Rome. As here in Rome further German action learn, in respect of the Jewish question, are no longer likely to be carried out, the matter which is awkward, from the point of view of German-Vatican relations, can therefore be regarded as settled. An indication of the Vatican attitude has in fact already appeared. The Osservator Romano, published in a prominent position, on 25th and the 26th of October, an official communique, on the activity of apostolic love, on the part of the Pope, which says, in the style characteristic of the Vatican newspaper, that is, extremely tortuous and vague, that the Pope bestows his fatherly care, on all men, irrespective of nationality and race. The many-sided and constant activity, of Pius XII has increased recently, as a result of the increased suffering of so many unfortunates. There is all the less reason, to raise objections to this announcement, since the wording, a translation of which is attached, will be taken by few people, as referring specifically to the Jewish question. These words are eloquent concerning the nature of the papal protests to Hitler. At the risk of criticism from opponents, the Pope was prepared to expend 6 million Jewish lives to avoid straining relations with the criminal of the century. The blood of the Jews was again on Rome's hands, in this, the greatest pogrom in the whole of history. It has been incorrectly suggested that Pius XII donated Vatican gold to ransom the Jews of Rome from the Germans. Robert Katz has detailed the story of the deportation of the Jews of Rome to the gas chambers and ovens of Auschwitz in October 1943, including the fact of the Pope's prior knowledge of the SS intentions and his failure to intervene or warn the victims. During the collection of 50 kilograms of gold from the Jews, to comply with an art sea demand, the Jews approached the Vatican for a temporary loan to meet the imposed deadline. Pius XII offered as much gold as the Jews required, on the condition that it be repaid. In the end the Vatican gold was neither requested by the Nazis, nor supplied to them. In any case the Jews of Italy were not saved, Italian police hunting them down on behalf of the Germans, even after the Pope's weak protest. In March and April 1944, the time of death for the over 1 million Jews in Hungary and Romania drew near. Rainer and Lich theme in Geneva, warned the Allies, and recommended that the Pope and other church leaders intervene. Among others, the Pope and the King of Sweden urged the Hungarian government to cease deportations. By the 8th of July the deportations had stopped, but almost 440,000 Jews had gone to their deaths. Diplomatic efforts were made to protect those remaining. The greatest effort was made by a Swedish diplomat in Hungary. Reuel Wallenberg, who bravely risked his life to shelter Jews in buildings, purchased for the purpose. Although massacres and forced marches destroyed the majority of the remaining Jews, before the Russian armies captured the area in February 1945, 200,000 Hungarian Jews survived. Wallenberg is credited with saving 20,000 of these himself, and of setting an example to the Vatican Nuncio and other embassies. Hunted himself by the Nazis and Hungarian fascists, Reuel Wallenberg was captured by the Soviet army on the 17th of January 1945, whence he was swallowed up by the Russian prison system, never to emerge. The feeble exertions of the Vatican to save Jews in 1944 seem to indicate a slightly changing position. Earlier, when Hitler rode on the crest of a wave, papal protests on behalf of the Jews were virtually non-existent such as were voiced, were not based on the immorality of the killings, but on considerations of expediency. Now, in 1944, with Russian successes in the East, the Allied capture of Italy and the D-Day landings in Normandy, the Third Reich was on the defensive. It was time for the papacy to be seen to be identifying itself with the cause that before long would prove victorious. Hence it responded to pressure to intercede on behalf of certain Jewish communities, though never in the vanguard of efforts to save them. The good deeds of some Catholic clergy in saving Jewish lives would prove useful in the sequel, when the church could claim that it had done what it could, in a spirit of brotherhood. But those who know the facts cannot be fooled. The verdict of history is that the Vatican and its experienced Pope, the agency best situated to bring powerful pressure to bear to stifle Hitler's holocaust against the Jews, and, most importantly, more responsible than any to help a people which it had caused to be hated, adopted a stand 
that aided and abetted the killers. A comprehensive study, Vatican Diplomacy and the Jews during the Holocaust, 1939-1943, examines the Pope's role with the assistance of selected Vatican archival documents for the period, the selection being made by R. A. Graham, the Vatican English-speaking historical editor. In his conclusions Morley makes the following statements. An attitude of reserve and prudence, joined with a desire to offend no nation, particularly German placed a straitjacket on Vatican diplomacy and made it little different from the diplomatic practices of civil states. The Pope, in defining and restraining Vatican diplomatic practice in this way, failed not only the Jews, but also many members of the church who suffered brutal treatment from the Germans. Moreover, he caused Vatican diplomacy to fail by forcing it to make a mockery of its claims that it was an ideal form of diplomacy dedicated to justice, brotherhood, and other similarly exalted goals, when in practice it made little attempt to work toward any of them. It must be concluded that Vatican diplomacy failed the Jews during the Holocaust by not doing all that it was possible for it to do on their behalf. It also failed itself because in neglecting the needs of the Jews and pursuing a goal of reserve rather than humanitarian concern, it betrayed the ideals that it had set for itself, the nuncios, the secretary of state, and, most of all, the pope, share the responsibility for this dual failure. Carlo Falcone, in 1970, also conducted considerable research into the activities of Pius XII during the existence of the Nazi regime, in an endeavor to ascertain the reason for his failure to speak out against the grossest genocide in history. He concludes that the Pope was aware of the nature and magnitude of Nazi crimes, so that ignorance was no excuse. He lists as possible reasons as the unpreparedness of Catholics, especially German Catholics, for a Vatican policy change on the Jews, a fear of communism, or threat to the survival of the church in Europe, a love of things German, and a trust in diplomacy. But those who understand the Bible do not have to cast about for an answer. The Pope acted in accordance with his position as the head of that man of sin system, the corporate seed of the serpent. The Vatican compact with Nazism remained active even after Hitler's death. Leading Nazi Jew killers were escaped from Europe under the umbrella of the Catholic Church, sometime with the assistance of Western intelligence agencies through a network dubbed appropriately the Roman Way. Operation Paperclip was one example of a secret program to help Nazis escape to the USA with the help of the Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency, carried out by Special Agents of Army Counterintelligence Corps, in which more than 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and technicians, such as Werner von Braun and his V-2 rocket team, were taken from Germany through Rome to the United States for US government employment between 1945 and 1959. One member of the German V2 rocket team was Kurt Debus, who was a member of the Nazi party and joined the SS in 1940. He would become, on July 1, 1962, the first director of NASA's Launch Operations Center and I in 1983 without facing any of the crimes committed while serving in the Nazi SS. These activities were easily camouflaged by the large number of refugees being resettled with church help through Rome in the immediate post-war period. The South American continent was the most favored destination. The commander of Treblinka extermination camp, when returned to Germany from South America, testified that Nazis on the run knew to seek help from Hütel, a German bishop in the Vatican. Hitler's orchestrator of the Holocaust, Adolf Eichmann, escaped through this route disguised as a Croatian refugee, having been sheltered by the Vatican. Klaus Barbie, the butcher of lions, received similar assistance, but with the connivance of the US intelligence agency as well. Many members of the Croatian Ustachi nationalist organization, notorious for brutal terrorist activities, were resettled in South America with the aid of a Croatian priest, Draganovic, working in the Vatican. The fiercely Catholic Ustachi had cooperated wholeheartedly with Hitler when he took over Yugoslavia, excelling even the Nazis in their enthusiasm for exterminating Serbs, who were Greek Orthodox, Jews and Gypsies. Many Catholic priests, monks, and friars had participated in bands which were responsible for bloody massacres. Pavelic, 
who was Hitler's appointee, to govern the independent state of Croatia, and who was fundamentally responsible for the massacres and deportations, was one of those who used the Roman way to freedom after the war. US intelligence reports released in January 1986 show that Draganovic, who was called the Vatican's chief of resettlement, provided tickets, visas, and passports to these Nazi collaborators, with the knowledge and approval of the Vatican. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to get notifications of new videos. Like, share and comment below.